Good afternoon and welcome to the third installment of our partnership with the American Liver Foundation. Uh, this is part three of liver disease and diet. And so um, I'm going to be a little bit transparent with you all. When we started this partnership, I was like the liver. Like the only thing I knew about the liver was two things. I didn't like it when it was smothered with onions and gravy. And I knew you could get cirrhosis if you drank too much. That was about it. But hopefully you've been with me on the course of these past couple of uh, episodes. We had a wonderful one last week, and then we had one two weeks prior to that, that have really opened up the liver and how important, not only what we know about the liver, but how important it is to our daily functioning. So we know the liver produces all the cholesterol in our body. We know the liver is the body's filter. So all that junk and pollutants that we put in our body, the liver filters it out. It does, it does whatever it can. Sometimes we overload it. And we're going to talk about that a little bit today with, with the things that we eat and the things that we put ingest into our bodies that can overload the liver and put it in a space where it can no longer function at the highest level that it possibly can. So really excited. We've got a wonderful, wonderful physician here to talk to you today. And wait till you hear what his credentials are. And you really go sit back and be like, I'm glad I signed it. This is the only one you've seen. This is the one you need to watch. And so got a little housekeeping on take care first, and then we're going to introduce you to our guests. So first and foremost, I want you to drop into the comment section where you're watching us from. Uh, we'd like to see where people are watching us from all over the world. We've got people from Ivory Coast and Nigeria and South Africa. So let us know. And if you're just here in the 404 with me, or if you're in the shy, you know, let us know where you are watching. Second of all, if you know somebody that could use this information, please make sure you tag them and share this information with them because we want to get this out to as many of our people as possible because this is very important in terms of how your liver functions in your body. And finally, if you have a question, and I see some people already have questions, if you have a question, make sure you drop it in the comment section so we can get ask our guest because he, if you don't know, we're going to find it. Okay. And so that's really what we need for you to do. And then one final thing I want to say is the American Liver Foundation would like to thank the sponsors for their support of this Focus on Black Health series on liver disease and liver cancer. So that is LSI, Bausch Foundation, Gen Genentech, and Merck. And so we are really, really happy with this potential partnership. So got all the housekeeping stuff out of the way. I thank you all for dropping where you're coming. I see Brooklyn, Philadelphia, Long Island, Miami Gardens, Oregon. Keep it coming in. Keep it coming in. North Carolina, Vermont. Oh, Vermont. That's great. So our guest today is Dr. Erwin McDonald. I'm going to like... It's a book over here, but I'm going to give you some of the highlights of, of who this man is. He is a gastroenterologist. I had to learn how to say that. Uh, and professionally trained chef. So he is a professionally trained chef that treats patients with small bowel diseases, obesity, and other conditions affecting the digestive system. He has worked for many years with Project Brotherhood, a healthcare clinic dedicated to providing accessible, affordable care for Black men on Chicago's South Side. So you know how we get down to Chicago. So he is right there in the middle of it there. Dr. McDonald uses creative approaches to help improve community health and enjoys giving healthy cooking demonstrations to under-resourced communities. And so he, not only is he a well-learned man, uh, he's got all the letters after his name, but he is a man of substance and believes in giving back to the community. So now he's a man that you can admire. So I have said enough about Dr. Madonna. Let's bring him on so you all can meet him uh, today. Hello, Dr. McDonald. How are you? Hey, what's up, Ellis? How's it going? Thanks for, for having me on. I appreciate that amazing introduction. I'm always humbled uh, to hear when people say those, those, those kind things about me. But uh, ultimately, I'm, I'm just a brother from the block. That's, that's all <laughs> I am, uh, who just so happened to, to go to medical school. But you know, really, my experiences uh, on the South Side are really what prompted me to be in this situation. Uh, you know, specifically focusing on food and nutrition because growing up here, you know, I grew up in, I don't know about you, I grew up in the church and yeah. I remember going to church and hearing about everybody sick and shut in with diabetes, uh, with heart attacks and heart disease, yeah. and even seeing people uh, who've lost limbs. So I'm a kid, I see somebody, you know, rolling down the aisle in a wheelchair, missing a leg, and I'm like, what happened? Oh, diabetes did that. I asked yeah. my parents, how do you get diabetes? Oh, because of what you eat. I see somebody with some dark sunglasses on, I'm like, hey, what happened to, you know, past the such and such? Oh, they went blind, diabetes. 
I asked wow. my parents again, how do you get diabetes? Oh, from what you eat. So as a kid, I saw people losing limbs, going blind, all because of food. Now, right. you know, I'm a big fan of the power of prayer, but I also believe in the power of eating differently. And, <laughs> and, right. and, and you, you know, I don't want to say one takes precedence over the other, but they both have a role. And what I realized, I'm like, they kept telling me all this food was doing these bad things to people. And I'm like, you know, we need to pray people eat differently. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's yeah. kind of, that, that got me on the path of cooking and nutrition. And uh, in addition, I was raised by some wonderful matriarchs that, that showed me the love of cooking at an early age. Right. And I just kind of took it from there. Well, I, I feel you on, on both those counts. Well, and, and I would just say this: the Bible also says, "Faith without work is dead." And yeah. so, you you can pray all you want to, but sometimes you got to put some work in it. And so, yeah. and that work is changing your eating habits if you're if you're unhealthy based on how you've been eating. So you've got to put in that work. The second thing I would say is, I, I feel you. I, I grew up, you know, mom cooked, and I would sit there and watch her, and then I started doing it, and. Uh, and so, so I'm not professionally trained like like you are. So I don't know some of the things you do, but I was good enough to be a home chef to where I had like a little catering business um, here in the Atlanta area for a couple of years and did did a couple of events and functions and things like that. So I'm a big fan of cooking. I still do catch that bug every once in a while. My family enjoys it when yeah. I say, well, I'm, "I'm gonna try something," you know. <laughs> so, that's good stuff. Like, I mean, yeah. honestly, culinary school it just uh, was icing on the cake when it comes to my my education, but. Uh, you know, most of the, the foundation was really just being a home cook and, you right. know, watching my grandmother's cook. And then eventually I started working in some restaurants. Uh, but, you know, the culinary school just kind of tied everything together. And if right. anything, it exposed me to different foods. OK, so, you, you yeah. know, my, my family members from, you know, we're from the South and I grew up cooking kind of that Southern Gulf Coast, <laughs> you know, Mississippi, New Orleans type food. Right. And and when I went to culinary school, it just opened my eyes to, you know, all different types of cooking. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, that's a good segue. But one of the things we wanted people to point out from this particular series is there is an illness in the liver called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in a FLD to be sure, for sure. And I think a lot of people don't really recognize what that is. They know they've heard the word cirrhosis, but we, as we learned on the first session, cirrhosis is just the fourth level of fibrosis when we're talking about scarring on the liver. So that's the end. And any, you know, so it's not just alcohol that causes cirrhosis, which is that's alcohol is a big a, a large contributor to cirrhosis, but there are other things that can cause cirrhosis and cause the liver to have some sort of fibrosis or scarring uh, associated with. And so kind of help our under our audience understand what is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and why it should be a concern for them uh, in today's time. Yeah. So when we eat food, uh, foods that contain any fat, uh, our intestines absorb that fat and it gets into the bloodstream. Uh, specifically, it gets into the, what's known as the portal vein, which is the main uh, vein that kind of feeds the liver. OK, so all the fat and everything that uh, we absorb goes into our bloodstream and it goes to the portal vein, which goes directly to the liver. And then all that blood goes through the liver where the liver more or less filters it. I mean, it's a little bit more complicated than just saying it's a filter. But, you know, technically, the liver is like a big sponge. It does a lot of different things. But one of uh, its responsibil responsibilities is kind of filtering the blood. Now, if there's too much fat uh, or lipids, specifically triglycerides uh, within the bloodstream, uh, some of those, some of that fat can't really be filtered out. And it builds up in the liver. Uh, so if you think about a dirty sponge, you know, just imagine you have a, a dirty sponge over time. It gets so dirty, a lot of stuff is building up and it's hard to even clean it out. So right. this fat can build up in the liver. And when that builds up in the liver, after a certain point, it can cause that fibrosis, that scarring, and even some inflammation, which we call steatohepatitis, okay, which okay. is just uh, inflammation of the liver from fat. But that can lead to cirrhosis. And cirrhosis... I'm telling you, like, I would not wish cirrhosis on my worst enemy. I mean, it's <laughs> like cirrhosis is bad news bears. Right. Uh, when I was a, a resident or even a medical student, you know, we would, uh, and this is back when, you know, we we're young in our training and, you know, everything is new. You see your first patient with cirrhosis, your first patient with HIV, your first patient with certain cancers. 
And, you know, I would talk to my other classmates at that time, like, man, this situation is messed up. You know, things that I really want to avoid in life uh, in terms <laughs> of conditions. And cirrhosis is on my top list. Like, wow. I wouldn't I want to risk cirrhosis on anybody. You know what I mean? Like, if Donald Trump has cirrhosis, I feel bad for Donald Trump. <laughs> I'm not even a Trump fan. Like, I don't, I don't want to see anybody get cirrhosis. That's how bad it is. You like, yeah, maybe we could just you know, take the court about those taxes, but I can't. I won't give them cirrhosis. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like we can talk about some other stuff, but not cirrhosis, uh, because you know what cirrhosis, um, what cirrhosis does. Um, the liver is so important for so many functions. Okay, so when the liver is not functioning. Uh, ammonia and other toxins can build up in our bloodstream, okay? Mm -hmm. And if they, if those toxins build up, they get into our brain and actually can impact our behavior and the way we think. And even in some people, uh, it can, you know, it, it essentially cause your brain to swell and put you in a coma. Uh, mm -hmm. Like that's one bad thing. Uh, when the liver is really scarred from cirrhosis, blood can't flow through it, okay? Mm -hmm. So blood has to find alternate ways back to the heart. And uh, those alternate ways, uh, we call those varices, okay? So mm -hmm. varices, variations, okay? So those varices typically by the esophagus are these big blood vessels where all the blood that normally would go through your liver is now going through these little blood vessels that shouldn't even be there. And as a result of all that pressure from all that blood, those blood vessels can bleed and that can be very life-threatening. And for me as a gastroenterologist, I mean, these are one of the things that, you know, if I get paged in the middle of the night, somebody's coming in, with bleeding and they have cirrhosis, I gotta get to the hospital quick because uh, it could be a problem. And I mean, I've been in situations where you're trying to stop bleeding and you know, I, again, I, yes, I went to medical school, but I was raised in the church, okay? So I've been in those situations, I'm doing you know the best I can as a doctor while simultaneously praying that this patient survives, okay? Because right. like, you know, just because I have skills don't mean those skills have to work. <laughs> right, right. Uh, um, so that's one issue with cirrhosis. Another issue with cirrhosis, uh, if the liver is not producing the proteins that it normally should make, um, right. as a result, a lot of uh, the protein levels in your bloodstream drop and fluid can leak out of your blood vessels into your belly. And we right. call that ascites, where the belly swells up and it's just filled with fluid. I mean, like literally, if you tap one person on the side of the belly and right. then you put your hand on the other side, you can feel the fluid just kind of move around. And it's a massive amount of fluid. I mean, to give you a frame of reference, uh, the most fluid that was ever removed from a patient with a cirrhosis at one time uh, was pretty much the equivalent of 44 uh, bottles of Coke, two liters, uh, 44 two liter bottles. So could you imagine running around with 44 two liters, about, two liters of fluid, you know, strapped to you? So that's how bad it is. And when I tell people, I don't wish that on anybody, uh, you know, this is why I say that because, right. you know, this is what suffering looks like. And, you know, as a brother from the South side, I've seen enough suffering. Like, I don't want to see anymore. Right. Well, well you know, I, one thing I do want to say, I was like, I do appreciate the fact that you are from there and decided to stay there to, to get back and try to help, you know, the communities. Because a lot of people, some people wouldn't do that. Some people say, hey, I'm smart. I've got some skill sets. I, you know, I could, I went to medical school and you went to a great medical school, culinary school. You're like, I could be out and I could avoid this danger, but you're, you're going back in there to try to help other people, uh, you know, change their behaviors. And, and some of those behavioral changes are how we eat. Yeah, and, and, and what we need. So we, we learned for those of you who have been with me for all three of these, I learned, you can correct me anytime I'm wrong, that uh, anytime the liver gets more than 5% fat, because the liver is supposed to be a very lean organ, right? It doesn't have a lot of fat or fatty tissue uh, associated with it. So um, anything more than 5% fat in that, in that liver could start causing that fibrosis or scarring. Is that accurate? Yeah, yeah, for the most part. Um, I mean, I, I think for, for most people, you know, no one's really kind of measuring the percentage per se, right? Uh, but just recognize that fatty liver can come along with uh, a couple different other conditions, uh, gaining excess weight. It can come along with diabetes. It can also come along with having high blood pressure and some combination thereof, which we call the metabolic syndrome. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, uh, people of color, we're at higher risk for metabolic syndrome. And we can get into a lot of reasons uh, for that. Um, 
you know, there's some reasons within our control and there's some factors that are, you know, operating at the level of society that needs to be fixed. Right. Um, but, you know, fundamentally, food still plays a role. Uh, and, and the good thing, what I love about, you know, all these, what I love about fat liver disease specifically, there's no medication for it. Okay. Um, mm. There's no medication. You can't take a pill to prevent it. However, uh, there's foods and literally the only treatment is food. Uh, okay. So a lot of times people want to go to the doctor and get on some special pill or, you know, take some supplements. I know a lot of people are trying to do these liver cleanses and all the detox stuff. I mean, none of that stuff is, is real. Right. Right. Uh, the foundation is the foods that you're eating. It's that simple. Period. Well, let's talk about that. What are, what are some foods that could really help? If we have some like some initial levels of scarring, but we're not quite there yet, let's say like we're at maybe you know level zero, level one in terms of fibrosis. What are some things that we could do? Some foods that we could eat that could really help, you know, for lack of a better term, detox the liver. Yeah. So uh, you know, detox. That's a. Uh, I know it pops up in in like all the time, especially on social media and Instagram and Twitter. People are doing this little detox. I would be careful for that with that terminology because no physician ever says detox. You know, the only time we use the terminology detox is uh, if someone is hooked on heroin or hooked on some drugs and they have to, you know, literally go through withdrawal. Uh, so we, you know, we may use detox. Uh, but as far as liver detoxification and whatnot, um, that's not something anyone ever prescribes. Okay. Uh, but you see it all over the place. And even when I see it all over the place, uh, as far as, you know, Instagram and people selling detoxes, my question is, it's like, well, what toxins are you trying to remove? Um, let's get down to the nitty gritty of it. And most of the times when you ask those specific questions, no one has any answers because right. you know, they're just trying to sell a product. So, <laughs> you know, I, and, and, and no offense to people trying to sell, sell these products or anything like that. But uh, for people who are out there, you have to really be able to, to, to separate marketing versus actual science. Right. Uh, because with marketing, you know, people trying to sell you something, even if it seems healthy, they're still trying to make a dollar off of you. Okay. Right. Uh, and that's, you know, I'm just putting it out there. So uh, specifically, uh, the way I would look at it is, you know, what, what are some strategies with food that you can use if you are trying to prevent fatty liver disease? Mm -hmm. or reverse fatty liver disease. If you're trying to decrease the amount of fat that's in your liver, or, or if you're trying to reverse some of the scarring uh, that can be associated with cirrhosis from fatty liver disease. So, um, and I wouldn't even look at it specifically as individual foods, okay? Because oftentimes when people just look at individual foods, you miss the bigger picture, okay? Uh, it's the whole lifestyle, the whole pattern of eating that plays a role, not just one thing, uh, the big picture, okay? It's the combination of things. So in general, we know as far as patterns of eating, uh, and I don't want to say diet because diet has uh, such a negative connotation. People hear the word diet and they think, oh, I can't eat anything. I'm on a diet. Reality right. is we're always on a diet. So the diet is nothing more than uh, the combinations of foods that you eat, period. Right. Like it doesn't have to be something that's associated with weight loss. All it is is what you're eating and that's your diet. So right. some people are on a diet that promotes weight gain. Some people are on a diet that promotes weight loss, but it's just a pattern of eating, okay? So the right. patterns of eating that have been associated with decreasing your risk of fatty liver disease would be uh, patterns of eating that typically are rich in fruits and vegetables and low in animal meat uh, or animal protein. So we're talking the Mediterranean diet, or vegetarian and vegan diets, okay? So okay. I don't I don't mean a, ve a vegan diet where you're just eating a whole bunch of junk food, but you're not eating meat. I mean like a, a diet that's rich in a variety of fruits and vegetables, because I've seen a lot of fake vegetarians, a lot of fake <laughs> vegans. <laughs> okay. I, say, I say fake vegans because uh, you're avoiding meat, but you're eating a whole bunch of fake food. Uh, right. You know, you're doing nothing but the Impossible Burger and the vegan bacon and all that other stuff, but you're right. actually not eating even eating a lot of fruits and vegetables. So I had a patient who was a vegan, and I'm I'm pretty much vegetarian myself. So I asked him like, "Oh, okay, brother, I see you out here vegetarian. It's good to see other brothers. You know, 60 years old vegetarian. Okay, you right. know, 
what type of vegetables are you eating? And the brother's like, I hate vegetables. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> like flag on the play, time out. <laughs> like, whatever sports analogy you want to use, we had we had the pause. I'm like, brother, how, how are you going to be a vegetarian? You hate vegetables. And his diet was basically like potato chips and, pop, and pasta. And I'm like, that's not a healthy diet by no means. And even yeah. though technically he can call himself a vegan because he's avoiding meat, but he's not really eating vegetables, not really eating fruits, not eating uh, plant-based yeah. products. So, you know, for the most part, those are the diets that have been associated with uh, decreasing your risk of fatty liver disease. Um, and specifically in terms of foods to avoid, a lot of the ultra processed foods. Okay. So have you heard this term ultra processed before? Yes. Uh, recently though. So, you know, I've heard processed, but not ultra processed. So I guess that's the, the ultra process is what I'm like, okay, I'm not quite sure what that is, but kind of help our audience understand what ultra processed means. Yeah, ultra processed. So one, we're not talking about hairstyles. I was at a church and I was giving a talk. <laughs> <laughs> I was giving a talk and I'm like, ultra processed. And like some brother was like, I had a comp back in the day. I'm like, no, this this is not the, the Duke texturizer for men. <laughs> <laughs> you throw old school stuff out there. <laughs> <laughs> right. This is not, you know, the ads they had in Ebony back in the day. I'm like yeah. talking about food. So um, there's four categories of processing, okay? So okay. you got your unprocessed uh, slash uh, minimally processed. And so your unprocessed foods are, you know, your, your, your raw vegetables and your, your, your raw fruit and stuff like that. Right. Um, you know, a food, you, you look at it, you know what it is. Like it's a banana, okay? Right. Um, your processed culinary ingredients would be uh, like your salt and, you know, the seasonings that you use and sugar and stuff like that. Then you have your processed foods, which uh, processed foods, they kind of resemble their unprocessed version. OK, so okay. you're talking about your, your canned goods. OK, so okay. like, you know, your canned corn, if you look at canned corn, it seems pretty similar to regular corn, okay? Right. You can see how they're related. Um, but one was just processed for the sake of, you know, preserving it and making it last longer and not spoil and whatnot. But your ultra processed foods really don't have any resemblance uh, to its unprocessed form, okay? Um, so a good example, I mean, it is, you know, the unprocessed form would be a cherry. Uh, the ultra processed form is cherry Coke. Gotcha. Okay. okay. Like, ain't no cherries in cherry Coke. No. <laughs> like, some cherry flavor that was uh, made with industrialized ingredients. So un ultra processed foods basically have industrial ingredients. Okay. These are ingredients that you can't get in the store. I mean, this is really like, you know, stuff that they're only using in factories and labs and, you know, food engineering. So like case in point, if I want to go home and, and make, you, you know, a, a, a Twinkie, I can't go home and make a Twinkie. Like I can't go to the store and get, you know, yellow number five and, you know, some of the emulsifiers like parley sorbate 80 and all this stuff. So for the listeners out there, if you're trying to figure out ways to identify what ultra processed food looks at, looks like, just look at the food label. OK, read the label. And if it has a bunch of chemical terms that you cannot pronounce, it's ultra processed food. If you feel like you have to have a Ph.D. in chemistry, just to understand what you're re eating. You're probably eating something ultra processed, right? Okay, so so that that makes it that makes it make sense. And so yeah, you know, my man John is saying, hey, that's a great analogy. So we got an interesting question from from Phyllis, and so I'm going to put this. It's more of a statement, but kind of help Phyllis understand this. So she was like, I don't get how you can be a vegetarian, which to me means no meat. Don't we need protein, uh, which meats provides, especially as we age? Yeah. So going back to the diet with um, for fatty liver disease, I mentioned the Mediterranean diet. So the Mediterranean diet is not a vegetarian diet. It okay. is a vegetarian diet. That's I mean, it's a diet that's low in meat, but it's not completely vegetarian. So the hallmarks of the Mediterranean diet is high in fruits and vegetables, high in beans, uh, high in olive oil, uh, low in a whole bunch of junk food, low in red meat. And uh, the protein source typically is the beans, and uh, you can also eat fish. 
Uh, so fish may have some benefits. Now, uh, to her question, how do you get protein if you're not eating meat? Valid question, okay? Uh, so there's plant-based sources of protein, okay? So protein can come from beans, it can come from nuts, it can come from, uh, you know, soy products, which are basically an extension of beans, and soy bean is a bean. You can get it from quinoa. Uh, certain whole grains have uh, a decent amount of protein. So uh, for people who are vegetarians, you can get, you know, more than enough protein. There's a lot of vegetarian athletes that, you know, are literally playing, you know, playing in the NFL and they're vegetarians. Um, so they're getting more than enough protein. And then within uh, being a vegetarian, there's various types, okay? So you have your uh, ovo-lacto vegetarians where, you know, they may eat eggs and, um, and milk and that's gonna be their protein source. Or you may have pescatarians right. where, you know, they're mostly vegetarian, but occasionally they're gonna eat some meat. Then you got flexitarians, which are flexible. So they may uh, eat meat, but they're probably only eating meat maybe once a week or so. So, right. you know, for all these different dietary strategies, I tell people kind of get in where you fit in to some degree. But ultimately, what's clearly established, uh, regardless of how vegetarian you want to be, you have to eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. And what we know right. is standard American diet, standard American diet, people aren't eating enough fruits and vegetables at all. And they're eating mostly right. junk food. In fact, uh, so if you had to guess what percentage uh, for the average American, what percentage of our diet is ultra processed foods? If you had to guess, I want you to throw some numbers out there. Oh, if I had to guess, yeah, uh, I would probably say two thirds to three quarters. So like sixty-seven to seventy-five percent of our diets, maybe even higher. But I would, I'm, I'm being generous yeah, for Americans. So, but I'm saying seventy-five percent of our diets are probably uh, ultra processed in some way. So you are pretty much spot on. So based upon uh, one of the studies done by the USDA, for the average American. Uh, regardless if you're black or white, 60% of your calories come from ultra processed food. So 60% of the food that we eat ain't even real food. <laughs> it's not even real food. And, and, and that is, that's not a lifestyle that's compatible with living a long, healthy life. Um, but it is compatible with getting conditions like fatty liver disease. Um, so like all the chips and, you know, again, uh, talking about, talking about ultra processed foods. So, you know, your tortilla chip versus corn, okay? Right, right. You know, High fructose corn syrup versus corn. These are right. very, you know, different things. They're almost not even related. So I can't look at a tortilla chip and say, oh, that came from corn. Um, it's almost unrecognizable. Right. Uh, it's delicious. I mean, Lord knows chips and salsa is great, but yeah. <laughs> it, 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 it's not good for you if done consistently over and over again. So right. now, am I saying, and this is one of the reasons why I like to emphasize pattern, okay? Am I saying if you eat some chips and salsa one time, you're going to end up with fatty liver disease? No, I'm not saying that at all. But if that is your dietary pattern that has been going on for years, where you're doing chips and salsa every single day, uh, you know, say you're watching the NFL or the, the NBA, and you're sitting down watching the game, a game every day, and that's what you're doing, then, uh, and if you're also not exercising, if you're also not eating fruits and vegetables and not you know, eating anything that can counteract the negative effects of what you're eating, yeah, for a lot of people, you can run into some issues. Or if you have some genetic predisposition for some of those issues on top of that, it could be a problem. So you know, there, there's a lot to unpack there. So I'm going to try to help summarize it for, for our audience. One, um, if you're not fully prepared to go vegan or vegetarian, uh, there are other options that are stops along the way. Uh, flexitarian being uh, being a term that people that, that mix in a little meat from time to time. And we talk about that on a program here on Tuesday nights. Uh, it's called Vegan-ish, and that's the name of the show. So it's like we tell people uh, what, what's vegan, what vegan food is, foods are, what vegan diets are, but it's really about um, modifying and really adding more fruits and vegetables to your diet. The second thing is we've got to understand that ultra-processed foods are – really kind of disrupting our dietary patterns and we're using and we're eating them more and more as as Americans. And so we've got to do a better job of reducing the amount of ultra processed food to even going down to just you know process where you have some canned foods and then ultimately where you need to be is the single or low process or no processed food, which is really fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, the Mediterranean diet is a great diet to 
potentially try in terms of uh, because it does have proteins in there. It does have like a lot of fish, uh, natural oils like olive oil, things of that nature. So, protein, so the Mediterranean diet, you can look that up anywhere and find out what the Mediterranean diet is. The Mediterranean diet has also been implicated to help uh, ward off prostate cancer. So that has also been implicated as well when we did our prostate cancer show, the Mediterranean diet came up during there. And so there are some ways to cleanse the liver, get it to make sure it is working at an optimal level. And the the common denominator, I'm going to take y'all back to, to high school math. The common denominator is fruits and vegetables. Fresh fruits and vegetables being it has to be a key source of your diet. And that's diet meaning just your regular eating pattern. Yeah. Fruits and vegetables need to be a key component, a larger component of your diet so you can help uh, keep your liver operating at the highest level. And not just your liver, your body in general. I mean, this, yes. like th this dietary pattern applies to everything. OK, it um, does. <laughs> so, I mean, if you're trying to avoid cancer, same thing. If you're trying to avoid dementia, same thing. If you're trying to avoid having heart attacks, same thing. I mean, it's, it's literally this is you got the, you got hypertension, diabetes, yeah. uh, high cholesterol, uh, prostate cancer, uh, and all of the like absolutely healthy living, a healthy uh, diet, uh, exercise, uh, good, uh, good rest, and try to reduce stress. Those four things will keep you pretty healthy in your lifetime without having to do too much more on top of that. Now, there's other factors like family history that could be a factor Definitely. in terms of whether or not the disease develops. So there's a question from from uh, from one of our viewers here, and they really want to know, are there any tests that can be done in terms of to determine the fat level in the kidney? Or is it just something that the, the doctor that... Um, that the doctor just kind of looks at you and says, okay, something's not right where you've got, I've heard about jaundice. I've heard there's kind of a graying of the skin that shows there might be some, some liver scarring and things like that. So what are some, some are, there, are there any tests or what are some markers of somebody that might have too much fat in their liver? Yeah, okay. So uh, as far as the jaundice in the skin, uh, that is a sign of what's known as decompensated cirrhosis, okay? So okay. that's like end stage. That is basically like the liver so scarred it can't really work well. And some okay. of the things that normally if we get filtered out, so this is uh, bilirubin, uh, don't get filtered out and it, it builds up in your bloodstream. And uh, the bilirubin, it kind of has this like yellowish appearance. And so when it builds up in the bloodstream, it can get into your, your skin and cause yellowing of the skin and your fingernails also gets into your eyes and makes your eyes yellow. So that's like, you know, you need a liver transplant when you start seeing that. That's that's what you want to avoid. So that's not what we're testing to look for. That's if you see that, that's a problem. Um, right. So I think typically uh, when it comes to fatty liver disease, and we're specifically talking about the liver, not the kidneys. Okay. Uh, right. So kidneys, something totally separate. Uh, but we're gonna have a whole nother show about the kidneys and itself. Uh, <laughs> we probably will because that, that's a, that's an important and 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 we're doing one. Just kind of shameless plug. We're doing one on, on somebody that kidney disease being associated with uh, diabetes, but that's yeah. Diabetes. Yeah. <laughs> and, and 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 cirrhosis also can lead to kidney failure. Okay, so we call that hepatic renal syndrome. So uh, one of the other Latin names for uh, for the liver is hepatic. Uh, so hepatic renal disease is you know kind of kidney disease from liver disease basically uh, so that happens so um as far as you know how do we test for uh, fatty liver disease simply just doing an ultrasound um is one of the most common ways that we find it and and we typically find it kind of accidentally so what happens is someone may have some belly pain it's pretty much not even related to the fatty liver disease but they're right. looking for like gallbladder problems, like gallstones, and they do ultrasound, uh, which is you know no different than what women have when they're pregnant. And they get ultrasounds of the baby and whatnot. Right. Uh, you can do ultrasounds of other body parts, uh, specifically the liver and the gallbladder. But the ultrasound can demonstrate that there may be some fat on the liver, or you know a CT scan can pick up fat in the liver. I wouldn't recommend everyone just saying, "Oh, give me a CT scan," because there is some. <laughs> 
radiation associated with CT scans. So those are things that, you know, they have their time and their place, but I want to just do it willy nilly uh, because you are technically exposing your body to some radiation. Uh, MRI can pick up fatty liver. Uh, MRI is not associated with radiation. Um, right. So that's, uh, you know, used often. And then there's this uh, special study called fiber scan. So the fiber scan can measure and detect how stiff and how much fibrosis there is in your liver. So how much scarring. Um, and then just regular uh, liver tests, okay? So oftentimes we'll get blood tests. Uh, when the liver is inflamed, some of the enzymes that normally exist in the liver can leak out into the bloodstream because of the inflammation, okay? Because of the right. liver damage. And uh, when those liver tests are elevated, we check your blood and see if there are certain enzymes in there that typically come from the liver. We can say, okay, there's inflammation in the liver. And oftentimes uh, with fatty liver disease, or at least uh, the inflammation form of fatty liver disease that we call uh, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, uh, or NASH for short, that's typically one of the reasons why people end up getting ultrasound. So we check the liver test, a little bit elevated, get ultrasound, and boom, we see the fatty liver. Uh, but those are pretty much all the different options for checking for fatty liver disease. So the good news is, you don't have to have um, once upon a time liver biopsy was the only option. This, you know, we're rarely doing liver biopsies for um, fatty liver disease. That's liver biopsy or biopsies. That's when you take a piece of the liver. Um, so you don't need to go through all that. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes when people have cirrhosis or we're not exactly cl clear what's causing the cirrhosis, you right. know, that can be an indication for a biopsy. But for most people who have fatty liver disease, you can get the diagnosis without a biopsy. And I'm going to add one one quick thing from the from the end user standpoint. When you go, you should be going for your regular checkups. When you go to your checkups, you have to be honest with your health care provider, right? You have to be honest with how much you're drinking, all right, in terms of alcohol, how much alcohol consumption. Because uh, you know, it, it, let, let's be real. Some of y'all be lying when y'all put put that you only have you know one drink, two or two drinks a week. And you know that, especially during the pandemic, because we know the sales of alcohol has gone up significantly during the pandemic. And it ain't just the alcoholics is drinking it. It's everybody's drinking it. So yeah. you have to be honest with your with your physician, your health care provider about how much you're drinking. You also have to be honest with your health care provider about what you're eating and how much you're eating, right? And so they're gonna get some clues from when they take your blood sugar and they and they draw your cholesterol. They're gonna get some clues in terms of what your diet, and remember that diet is just your regular pattern of eating, they're going to get some clues about it. But if you're more honest with them, the more honest you are, the better they have a chance of catching something potentially early where you could be at zero or one in terms of fibrosis, where that your liver could you know, respond from that versus you are not being as honest or you avoid going to the doctor because you don't want to share that information. Yeah. And how your liver uh, disease progresses to a point where it's, it's getting to a serious level where you do have that jaundice or you do have that bloated belly filled with, you know, liters of, of fluid that, yeah. you know, and that your life is seriously compromised at that point in time. Yeah. So, I mean, and I, I, I love the fact that you said be honest because, uh, you know, you're only hurting yourself when you don't tell the truth. OK. <laughs> and, 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 you know, I. I call people out in a way that's supportive and friendly and whatnot. And I maybe calling out is not the the right term because that has so many negative connotations. I, I, I try to get to the bottom of what people are telling me. So uh, you mentioned alcohol. Alcohol, that's alcoholic fatty liver disease. That's, you know, something different, but it's the right. same issue. OK, so the number one reason for transplant nowadays is going to be liver disease from alcohol. Number two is liver disease from eating a whole bunch of foods, um, which would be the fatty liver disease, the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. But I talk to people about alcohol all the time. So people are like, hey man, you know, I'm healthy. I drink a glass of red wine every day. And I'm like, oh, okay, glass of red wine, no problem. But then I ask, you know, how big is the glass? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you know, probably maybe, you know, about the size of a bottle. I'm like, you know, that's not, that's not a yeah. glass. You're drinking a bottle of wine. <laughs> but yeah. If you drink that big glass. glass. I've seen those glasses where you can pour a whole bottle in it and yeah. you say, yeah, one glass of wine. I've seen those glasses yeah. and I'm like, yeah. Yeah, that's that's not a glass. Um, so if you're drinking a pitcher of tequ tequila, like just because you're using a pitcher, don't make it a glass, you know. <laughs> um, and, and and for drinks, just to give people a frame of reference, okay. So we we say for men, 
And this is, you know, people who don't have a history of alcoholism, a history of, you know, family history of alcohol and disease and stuff like that. And, you know, your liver is uh, relatively normal. So we say for men in general, uh, you should not have more than 21 standard drinks um, uh, within a week. OK, so standard drinks, you know, not the big drinks, the standard drinks. OK, one ounce of alcohol, it's uh, what is it? Six ounces of wine and 12 ounces of beer, I think. Is that the... Yeah, more or less. Yeah, um, right on there. So and, and then for women, uh, no more than 14. OK. Right. Uh, so am I saying, you know, everyone should go out and try to get, you know, 21 drinks? Like, no, that's not what I'm saying. Uh, like, that is the point where it's a problem. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's like on paper, it's a problem for pretty much most people on average. OK. And, you know, a lot of times people don't even keep track of how much they're drinking on a, a Saturday or Sunday. OK. Or a weekend. And Especially like, during the football season. Look, yeah, I'm speaking for myself in part, so I, you know I know I know what it is because it's like it's football season. You go to a sports bar or you're yeah. at home, and you might be sitting. Oh, I kind of you know I got a twelve pack, six pack beer. Next thing you know, I drank the whole thing, and I've been watching two or three games, and right. now I'm you know, six, eight in that one day, in that one sitting, and right. that's kind of a binge. Right. And I might feel good because I'm at home, so I'm not endangering lives. I'm at home, but yeah. I'm engaging my own life. I right. putting too much alcohol in my system. Right. So, you know, say say Saturday you're watching college football and you mm -hmm. drink your, you know, your six pack. OK. Sunday, watching a bunch of NFL games. And Monday night, you're doing the same thing. Uh, you look up. It's easy just in those three days to get, you know, 12, 18 drinks. And then say you're trying to be healthy. Like, OK, I'm going to do my red wine on top of that. So you're doing red wine, you know. You know, once a day for those other days, you look up, you know, you got more than 21 drinks. Um, yeah. But a lot of times we think of that 21 drink, you know, per week person as an alcoholic. It is easy to not, you know, to not fall under the category of alcoholic and still take in all those drinks. And for women, you know, we're talking 14. OK, uh, 14 drinks. Like, you know, you out here kicking with your girls and whatnot. It's ladies night and everyone's drinking Moscato and you know, getting your margarita on and whatnot, like 14 drinks, it'll, it, it'll creep up on you. It, it could add up very, very quickly. So, all right, so there are some, there's there's a question here from uh, Sean. Thank you for the question, Sean. And um, apple cider vinegar has been, has become very, very popular to the point where you've got companies making gummies and yeah. you, you, there's a lot of people that are kind of pushing apple cider vinegar as an as an appetite suppressant, as a yeah. cleanse, as yeah. all of these things. So I'm, on the, I'm on the medical advisory board for Bragg's. Okay, so help us understand, are there benefits from apple cider vinegar? If so, what are they? And then how much, how should we be incorporating that in, into our diet, you know, if we should at all? Yeah, um, so apple cider vinegar, again, this is, I, I want people to get the foundation, okay? Right, right. Like the foundation for healthy living. And again, I'm on an advisory board for Bragg's, okay? And this right. is what I tell the people at Bragg's. I'm going to tell everybody the same. The the foundation uh, of your, say, say your body and your health is a house, okay? Right. You don't have that strong foundation. I don't care what curtains you put on the windows. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So like the apple cider vinegar is curtains, okay? Uh, okay. Yeah, nice curtains, you know, I help a house with a nice foundation. But if you don't have that foundation, you know, the curtains is not going to be what the house is built on. Okay. okay. Um, so that's first and foremost. If people are interested in any supplement, you, you the key word is supplement. Okay. It supplements a healthy diet. It does not replace. Okay. Uh, no one's out here marketing replacements. But a lot of times people want to use these supplements as replacements to make right. up for what they're not doing. And there's nothing out there that works like that. Uh, even the medications that we give as doctors, as prescriptions, like you take all the blood pressure medication in the world, but if your diet is not healthy, it's not going to work. You're still going to have high blood pressure. And what are you going to do? They're just going to have more blood pressure medications. And then right. you're still going to have high blood pressure. <laughs> right. Same with diabetes. You just get to the point where they just add insulin um, because, you know, you haven't set that foundation unless you have type 1 diabetes, which is a whole separate conversation. Um, but apple cider vinegar, 
uh, apple cider vinegar, according to the evidence-based studies, uh, has been associated with weight loss. Uh, not a you know not a significant amount, but you know a real amount. Uh, so you know if you're trying to lose weight, uh, you still have to go through the motions and exercise, eat right. But if you add apple cider vinegar to a dietary pattern of eating where you're reducing the amount of calories that you're you're consuming and you're also burning off a little bit more calories, uh, if you add some apple cider vinegar to that, that may have some added benefit than not doing it. Okay, but if you're just doing apple cider vinegar without doing that stuff. Who knows what it's going to do for you? OK, um, and it may help out with uh, blood sugar control. Um, so is it going to take someone who's diabetic and make them a non-diabetic? Probably not. Uh, but it may have some modest effect on blood sugars. Now, the, the key is identifying how much uh, apple cider vinegar you should be taking based upon the studies. OK, so the reality is, uh, again, there's a lot of companies out here trying to hustle folk. OK, um, so a lot of these gummies and a lot of this other stuff, they have nowhere near the acetic acid. Uh, so acetic acid is the main ingredient of this apple cider vinegar. OK, uh, so most of the studies uh, that have been done have looked at, you know, specifically giving people acetic acid uh, and all the studies that have been associated with weight loss incorporated about 750 milligrams of acetic acid. OK, so this is where you got to look at the food labels and uh, really see if they are actually giving you something that actually has benefits. So some of these companies are marketing, you know, um, these gummies with a set, a apple cider vinegar, but it only has like two milligrams of acetic acid. So on the front, they say, oh, it's going to help you lose weight and it's good for your gut, but it doesn't have the, apple, the, the active ingredient. Uh, not enough in any way to, to help you, okay? That's almost like you know, we know the studies in cardiology looked at 81 milligrams of aspirin and 325 milligrams of aspirin. But mm -hmm. imagine somebody just had a tablet that said, OK, one milligram of aspirin and they're going to say it does the same thing as what's actually been studied. So that's what's happening right now with uh, apple cider vinegar. So these gummies, uh, if you look on the back, they may they may say how much acetic acid they have. But typically okay. what they're going to say is the percent of apple cider vinegar which is very different okay because um, most of these capsules uh that percentage is super duper low so they may say like 320 milligrams of five percent apple cider vinegar um and now you know when you start doing the math you're like wait a minute like you know this 325 milligrams of five percent apple cider vinegar only has five percent so you got to multiply that 325 by five percent to get the milligrams of acetic acid uh, but a lot of people aren't doing the math like that uh, but the companies they know that okay so they're taking advantage of us not thinking about things uh, and that's part of the problem when it comes to the world of nutrition uh, it's easy to get duped because people are just trying to make money uh, but you know, ultimately, it's a placebo effect, though. that could have a placebo effect, right? You say, okay, I got this jar of gummies, uh, and it says take two as, yeah. a, as an appetite suppressant, and this will help you lose weight, right? So they don't tell you about the the active ingredient, how much of that active ingredient you need. They well, say I take two of these gummies, it should be al uh, appetite suppressant. I should eat less, and I should yeah. lose weight. So yeah. one, I'm believing this is happening, but you know, with the placebo effect, the stuff really does happen. And with this situation, it ain't even happening. Like a lot of times people are just doing it and it's not happening. Now, if you're doing a, a supplement like the, the Braggs, they have uh, their new capsules that came out. They have 750 milligrams of acetic acid in there. And uh, I believe that's one of the only ones on the market that's truly, you know, giving uh, what they, you know, what they claim is in there. And then they also have a medical advisory board of scientists and people like myself keeping them accountable. Okay. Uh, that's probably why they got 750 milligrams because you said that's what the study showed is the most effective. Yeah. And you're like, hey, I can't put my name on this if you're not going to at least match <laughs> what the, or at least give people the information that they need right. that is going to be true to what. Well, okay, I got you. Yeah. yeah. So I'm in a meeting, you know, more or less just telling folks, like, you can't run game on people. <laughs> Right. <laughs> like, if you're going to run game on people, I don't need to be involved. I can't be involved with it. And that's really okay. So, one of the uh, things about apple cider vinegar. So, uh, 750 milligrams is typically uh, that's in two tablespoons of apple cider vinegar. So, if you're trying to drink the apple cider vinegar, you probably have to do about two tablespoons to get that 750 milligrams. 
Okay. Uh, if you're drinking apple cider vinegar, be careful because people who have acid reflux, that can kind of trigger some of that acid reflux. And also if you have bad teeth, um, the okay. acetic acid can kind of erode your enamel, which can further worsen your teeth to some degree. So if you're gonna do it, I would just dilute it in some water and whatnot. Uh, you're still gonna get the acetic acid, but it's not gonna be as harsh on your teeth. Um, so I'm just gonna put that out there. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't like the taste of it, I, I tried it. I was like, yeah. <laughs> it's like it's it's just such a strong taste. Um, it's not for everybody. <laughs> it's, yeah. Well, for me, I'm I'm gonna go with 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 some vegetables and exercise. But hey, it's, 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 yeah. it's, um, it's the foundation. You know, and yeah. even with exercise, you know, it's a lot of people working out and trying to eat right, and it's you know still hard to lose weight. Uh, there's a lot of different reasons for that. Uh, right. So I don't have any issues with anybody looking uh, for some of those extra supplements uh, that are, have evidence behind them. Uh, be careful because folks are getting hustled. OK, like a lot of people are trying to sell, you know, Herbalife and like all these supplements out the back of the car. Like, right. I don't know. This kind of smells it smells like a hustle. <laughs> yeah. You know, our first our first um, doctor that we had on the series, Dr. Gunn, she talked about uh, it was a worst case scenario, but she was in the military and there was a guy who was trying to lose weight to make weight that they have to. Um, and so they would always be when they were about to weigh in, they'd have to, you know, these guys would be putting on the garbage bags and running around the track and all the stuff trying to drop weight. And one guy was taking what he thought was like it was a supplement they thought was safe. He bought it over the counter, had no FDA, you know, anything on it, but he was taking it. Yeah. And and over time, it destroyed his liver. Yeah, you can go on the liver failure. Like and I've he, seen. He, yes. Look, I, I've seen it with my own two eyes. Right. You know, young you know, young dudes coming into hospital, you know, trying to do something that's going to boost their testosterone or like speed up their metabolism and whatnot, right. and come in with liver failure, uh, yeah. acute liver failure. Uh, so now, and it doesn't even have to be something over time. I mean, this can happen pretty quickly. Yes. And acute liver yeah. failure, you go from normal to abnormal within a day, um, and it's it's bad, and that's uh, that's like you need an emergent liver transplant. Uh, there's yeah. no medication. There's no okay. Let's you know see how it does. Like if we don't get this person a liver, they're not going to be around. Yes, yeah, Sean. He did say two tablespoons. If you're gonna if you're gonna take the the liquid, it's two tablespoons. You can dilute it in water if you're you know averse to taste like me. Um, you can dilute it in some water and drink it that way. But you're gonna yes, you still need two tablespoons of the apple cider vinegar to get to that 750 milligram level of the acid that you need. That's and, going to be beneficial. And and what I tell folks, so just make a salad dressing, okay? Like we don't. <laughs> <laughs> We don't have to, you know, make this any more complicated, okay? Uh, so for me as a chef, uh, right. and I, I like apple cider vinegar. It's my favorite vinegar to use in salad dressings because um, it's a very neutral vinegar, okay? So okay. it's not a vinegar that's going to overwhelm uh, whatever oil you're using. Uh, it's not going to have a super strong flavor, uh, right. but you're still going to get that tang. Uh, therefore, I think I, you can use it in a lot of different stuff, okay? So for me, I try to eat salads all the time because it's just an easy way to throw a bunch of fruits and vegetables in there, okay? And making my own salad dressing super duper easy. If you're trying to be on this Mediterranean lifestyle, that's fine. You know, get two tablespoons of olive oil, two tablespoons of apple cider vinegar, you know, mix it up, add a little seasoning in there, you're good to go. And Throw it on some baby spinach and some beans and, you know, maybe some onions and some red peppers or something like that. You got a pretty easy salad. <laughs> um, so all this cooking, you know, when it comes to fruits and vegetables and vegetarian lifestyle, this is really not complicated stuff. OK, mm -hmm. you know, if you think you have to do impossible burgers every single night, you're making it, you're overthinking it. OK. Uh, okay. And for folks who don't want to be vegetarians. You know, that's fine, you know, but if you're looking for ways to increase the amount of fruits and vegetables you're taking in, a salad is super duper simple. And if you're trying to do some apple cider vinegar, you know, put any salad dressing. Um, it's probably the easiest way to do it. And I think, I think I don't want people to miss that point, but I think a lot of times when we start talking about eating healthy and incorporating more fruits and vegetables in their diet, they, they have to make this kind of dramatic change. And what you just talked about is something that's very, very comfortable. Salads work, right? If you mix in, if you and and it's it's about you know those steps, right? You know because Rome wasn't built in a day, um, and so 
it didn't take time for us to get develop bad habits. It took time for us to develop bad habits. So it's going to take that you know time to develop good habits uh, as well. And so I think if you could just say, okay, well, once you know, I'm going to start eating a salad instead of you know a burrito or you know whatever. Make those changes. Adding the butter vinegar to you know, the dressing, creating, making your own dressing, and putting out some of those, the most fattier ingredients, and then creating something that's lighter and, and that more palatable. Those things can definitely be, you know, changes that you can make immediately that aren't super dramatic, but can have a, a positive effect on your overall health and health. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Now, I'm not sure if you can. Am I, am, I, am I breaking up right now? Or are we good still? I think you're good. You're good. You're good. Okay, good. So, other foods that can help out with preventing fatty liver disease or even treating fatty liver disease, and this is literally what we recommend to people in clinic. So, people come in, they're like, "Oh, you know, I have fatty liver disease." Like, we're not putting people on medications. We're literally talking about food. So, olive oil independently has been associated with uh, helping out with fatty liver disease. Um, so does that mean everyone drink a whole bunch of olive oil? Be careful. There's calories and stuff like that in there. Yeah. But if you're making your own salad dressings, you know, you can throw in some olive oil, you know, throw, throw in some olive oil. If you're looking for, you know, something to dip your vegetables in, you can, you know, mix it up and make an olive oil based dip. There's a lot of different ways you can incorporate some olive oil. Uh, coffee has been associated with uh, helping out fatty liver disease. Now, I'm not talking about the big, massive latte from Starbucks. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not yeah. talking about, you know, your, your cream with coffee. Right. <laughs> Where people are putting a whole bunch of cream in there and, you know, your coffee looks like I'll be sure. Like, that's not, that's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm talking about, talking about black coffee. coffee. <laughs> so that, you know, the black coffee, no sugar, no cream. It, and maybe I'm aging myself because I know that heavy D song, uh, but you, like you, you did, you did. But since I, I guess based on a couple of things that you said, we're probably around the same age. So I, I, I'm catching all your reference. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so you know where I'm coming from. But I know, it, I know where you're at. the studies show that black filtered coffee specifically can help uh, reverse fatty liver disease and also decrease the risk of liver cancer. Okay, and I want to say filtered specifically because unfiltered coffee may do the opposite. Unfiltered coffee can actually raise your cholesterol levels. <clears throat> okay. So you're unfiltered, you know, that's people using the French press and stuff like that. So you really, if you're going to be drinking coffee, it should be filtered. Okay. It's a simple filtered coffee. So yeah. here, here's an interesting question from, from Vivian. She says, if you fix fatty liver disease, um, can that reverse? Type two diabetes. If you fix fatty liver, can that reverse type two diabetes? Um, we don't know. I mean, fatty liver and type two diabetes are interrelated. Okay, so I wouldn't look at it as an either or situation. Uh, I think if your lifestyle is leading to an improvement in fatty liver disease, it's also simultaneously going to improve your diabetes. Okay. Right. So, you know, again, not an either or situation. And the same with type 2 diabetes. If you're eating a diet that's lowering your hemoglobin A1C, which is a marker of how well your blood sugars are controlled, if you do also have fatty liver disease, you're, the fatty liver disease is going to get better. Because ultimately, with both of those conditions, part of the, 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 the prescription that we recommend is weight loss, okay? So we know right. for diabetes, if you lose about five to seven percent of your body weight, uh, the diabetes is going to improve significantly. Okay, yeah. and the same thing with fatty liver disease. But uh, the diets that are associated, the pattern of eating that are associated with weight loss, are pretty much the same. Okay, so you're reducing your calories. Uh, typically, eating less than uh, 500 calories than what you normally would. So take what you normally eat and just chop off 500 calories. For the most part, uh, for the average person, that can lead to some weight loss. And then if you want to make that even healthier by having a mix of fruits and vegetables and cutting down of the, the ultra processed food, you know, most people would lose substantial weight and also see improvements in not only uh, diabetes, not only fatty liver disease, but also blood pressure uh, and your cholesterol levels. And then you want to add some exercise to the mix. It's even better. Um, yeah. <laughs> so that's, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's the foundation. Uh, and it's it's tough. I say that foundation like it's easy, 
but there's a lot of reasons why that foundation is hard. Okay. Um, when it comes to foods that we eat, uh, there's a lot of trash that's marketed to us. Uh, specifically as black people, we get the most, so in terms of unhealthy food, most of those marketing dollars are spent on us <laughs> way yeah. more so than anybody else. And that's like facts. Uh, it, it, depending on where you live, uh, you may live in a neighborhood, which again, I'm coming from the South side of Chicago. You may live in a neighborhood where you see more fast food restaurants than anything else. Uh, so mm -hmm. imagine trying to live, you know, trying to, trying to lose weight. If on your way home, you got to drive by, you know, seven restaurants that have foods that you're basically addicted to. Okay. I mean, that's like being a bartender working in a bar, <laughs> but you know, depending on where you live, that is the equivalent of what your environment's like. And we know based upon studies, black neighborhoods have two point time, no, 2.5 times more fast food restaurants and restaurants in general than white neighborhoods uh, mm -hmm. and less grocery stores. Uh, so does that mean you're set up for failure? No, it doesn't mean you're set up for failure, but it means that there's obstacles that uh, are in our environment that we have to figure out, we have to be aware of. And the awareness will help us navigate those situations. We, have, we have, I always have to be cognizant of those things. And so I want to point everybody to uh, the website that's scrolling across the bottom of the screen. If you want more information, please go to deliverfoundation.org. If you have more information about your liver and liver health, and, and or if you can go to, if you want to go to the Black Doctor YouTube page, you can watch all three of these series from Dr. Dunn to Dr. McDonald. Uh, there's a lot of information in all three of those that are just kind of fascinating about the living and get you to the point. We talked about talking last week. Uh, there was a uh, they said last week about something about um, there's a form of hypertension that can come in the liver. Let's see here. So you're breaking up just a little bit. Uh, I don't know. Okay. It's my camera. Uh, it's like, I mean, you're not even breaking up, it's kind of fuzzy. Okay. Uh, so the sound was distorted. So I didn't quite catch the catch question, uh, but uh, if it can pop up in the chat or or something, I, I can answer it. And then one more thing about uh, uh, the apple cider vinegar gummies. Uh, before I go on, I failed to mention. So mind you, those gummies they're gummy bears. Okay, <laughs> like people don't lose weight by eating gummy bears. Like, <laughs> so when you look at those. There's a process. Yeah, can, uh, so a lot of those gummies can easily have 50 calories, and you know people are they taste good. So people are snacking on a whole bunch of gummies, and you're actually taking in extra calories. Okay, so the key to weight loss is actually decreasing your calories. Uh, so folks are eating gummy bears with calories, even though it may have some apple cider vinegar in it. That may not be the thing that's going to help you. Okay, uh, I know it's marketed as that, but bear in mind people are trying to make money. And uh, the apple cider vinegar uh, brags is one of the reasons why we said don't do the gummies. Uh, just give them some apple si acetic acid capsules where you're not getting all the extra sugar and all that stuff. You're just getting the active ingredient. Um, right. So, you know, do they taste like gummy bears? No, they don't taste like gummy bears. But that's not the point. Uh, the point is the acetic acid. OK, if you want gummy bears and you're trying to lose weight, I wish it was that easy. Like, I wish we could just eat a whole bunch of gummy bears. And, and lose weight. I literally would send people to the pharmacy to get gummy bears, but that's not that's not reality. After after you start your company, yeah, you got to start the company first, uh, manufacturing gummy bears, and then we'll then we'll say, hey, look, we got the the magic potion here. Yeah. So, Dr. McDonald, I want to say thank you for for joining us today. I mean, we could talk about liver health really all day, but we've done. I think a very good job in terms of really talking about uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease that many people should be concerned about. Be concerned about the fibrosis in your the, the liver. Really, what it boils down to is eating a healthier diet. And yes, I do agree. Phyllis, to a certain extent, fruits and vegetables can be expensive, especially if you're living in a food desert. Can be, but there are ways to incorporate more fruits and vegetables in your diet that are, you know, that have, that aren't as monetarily um, constricting. So, but again, I want to say thank you to Dr. McDonald. Thank you to the Liver Foundation. 
thank you to everybody that stuck with us today and asked your wonderful questions. I know we didn't get to them all, but I think we got some of the, the better questions answered. Uh, please check back go to uh, blackdoctor.org. Uh, there's a whole category of health conditions about liver cancer. We've got a multitude of articles that talks about foods with diet and things like that that can help. We're going to be adding more articles going forward. So um, again, thank you all for joining us today, and we will see you all next time. All right. Thanks. Thanks again.